looking up to the heavens, gazing at the sea of stars, to know that somewhere out there, the saga of an advanced people is beyond our reach. Their stories were told, echoing through the darkness. With the light from those stars the only way to remember them, the echoes of a past that should not be forgotten. On December 17, 1993, Sega released Fantasy Star, The End of the Millennium, for the Mega Drive in Japan, a game that would go on to be remembered as one of the greats, even now, 30 plus years later. The End of the Millennium serves as the fourth game in the Fantasy Star series. The original entry goes back to the Mark III and Master System in 1987. Fantasy Star 1 sets the series in motion with the story of the far-flung Algol star system and its three planets, Palma, Motavia, and Azorus. In that first adventure, a group of young warriors take on the evil King Lashik and the Dark Force to liberate Algol. The second game, released for the Mega Drive in 1989, takes place 1,000 years later. The Dark Force returns to an unsuspecting Algol, now controlled by an all-powerful supercomputer. Mother Brain. As the heroes of Fantasy Star 2 investigate, the Algol system is sent into chaos. The planet Palma explodes. The events would come to be known as the Great Collapse. Fantasy Star 3, Generations of Doom, released for the Mega Drive in 1990, continued where the previous game had left off. During the Great Collapse, hundreds of spaceships were sent out into the universe, looking for a new home. The Dark Force managed to hunt down and destroy all of these ships, save for only two. 1,000 years after leaving Algol, the Dark Force was sealed in one of these two ships, and eventually forgotten, until another thousand years had passed, when the descendants of Palma fought for their survival once again. All three games were brought to the West with full English translations, and were released to critical praise. The sci-fi theme stood out during the first wave of TV game RPGs, which were mostly medieval in style. The concepts of humanity versus technology, balanced with the eternal struggles of good against evil, were highly lauded. When Generations of Doom made its way west in 1991, reviews had proclaimed it the greatest RPG of all time. Phantasy Star 3 was released at a time when Sega was at a crossroads. Prior to 1991, the company had been seen in both Japan and the US as an also-ran in the home video game space, against its main rival, Nintendo. Sega had always been more respected in regards to its arcade offerings. The Genesis and Mega Drive were positioned as a place for older, more serious gamers, where these arcade experiences could be brought home. As well, more challenging, PC-like strategy and role-playing games flourished here. In 1991, Sega overtook Nintendo as the market leader in the US. To develop some of the games that broadened Sega's audience, many key players involved in the Fantasy Star series were moved to other projects. Mainly, but not solely, the Sonic series. 1991 turned to 1992. A wave of new, enjoyable games for the Genesis and Mega Drive were sold to an eager audience. Fantasy Star 2 and 3, while still in print, faded into the background as the 16-bit era kicked into high gear. What nobody at home knew was that a new Fantasy Star was in the works all this time. Sega announced the fourth game in the series at the 1992 Tokyo Toy Show, an annual event that showed off the latest toys and video games, held the first week in June that year. No recorded video of the game in action nor a demo of the game itself has survived. Photos of the work in progress were covered by the usual news outlets by the end of summer 1992. The scant information given didn't say much about the story, except that the game would return to the Algol star system, would take place after the events of the second game, feature characters and references from all past games, and serve as a grand finale to the series.
As the news of a new fantasy star started to leak out, Sega was there to explain the production process and what to expect from the game. In October 1992, Mega Drive Fan Magazine held the first interview with the production staff of Fantasy Star 4. The article announced that Toru Yoshida, often referred to and credited as Yoshibon, would be the director and scenario writer of the game. He had worked on Fantasy Star 2 as a character designer and as a consultant on Fantasy Star 3, the only member of that team who was not a newcomer to the series. In addition, he designed all of the in-game artwork for the Fantasy Star 2 text adventure games for the Sega MegaNet online service. Along with Yoshibon, a core team would comprise a few familiar faces from the world of Fantasy Star. Bieko Kodama, aka the Great Phoenix Rie, served as project leader. Though technically the boss, she saw herself as an equal member of the team. She contributed to nearly every area of the game, thanks to everything requiring her final approval. On her own, she designed many of the field graphics and object designs. Akinori Nishiyama, also known as Locky P, wrote the script, as well as work on maps, objects, and mechanics of the game. He was part of the Fantasy Star 1 team. Izuho Numata, ne Takayuchi, the composer of Fantasy Star 3, would return for the soundtrack to 4. Known by the moniker Ippo, her compositions in and out of Fantasy Star were some of the best of the era. LC, otherwise known as Kazuyoshi Tsugawa, designed the visual event graphics, as well as other elements related to maps and battles. Yoshiaki Endo, under the alias Menmei, programmed the game. The interview was just the first in a longer series, titled The Fantasy Star 4 Club. As the calendar turned to 1993, more information followed. Yoshibon explained various concepts for the game and how the work in progress was moving along. Sega initially approved the game for release on the Mega CD. Fantasy Star 4 was intended to have animated scenes in between gameplay, complete with voiceovers, similar to other CD games of the time, such as Lunar and Cosmic Fantasy. Sega pulled back on the idea, reassigning the game to a 16 megabit cartridge. As work continued, Yoshibon petitioned for, and was granted, 24 megabits, an unheard of amount in 1993, but a memory size that would soon become standard as the 16-bit era matured. A 3D perspective for dungeons and caves, like those in Phantasy Star 1, was considered, only to be dropped in favor of a traditional top-down perspective, citing the lack of memory space as one reason for the change, while also never being able to make the mazes have the same jaw-dropping appeal they had in 1987. One funny revelation was that Yoshibon came up with most of his ideas for Phantasy Star 4 while sitting in the bathtub. His mind would wander on how to properly continue the story where the original three games left off. Fantasy Star 2 ended on a cliffhanger. Even in 3, the ultimate fate of Algol was not addressed. The focus quickly coalesced around Motavia and Azorus after the Great Collapse. It was a blank canvas where the story could continue in any way the team saw fit. Characters, locations, and scenarios from all three past games would find their way into the story. The Zorians and Motavians would join the fight. Robots, too. The dialogue would be vast and varied, unlike any game before. Some of Yoshibon's conversations covered intricate connections to past games as a reminder for what to look for when the new game is finally released, planned for the end of 1993. Fans also submitted artwork in anticipation of the game. In other Japanese magazines, Sega shared more screenshots and information via press releases. These were not as personable as the ones in Mega Drive Fan, but were informative. Many of these articles would make their way to the West. Until release day in Japan, not much could be known about the game, though these news flashes allowed English-speaking fans to learn a little something and dream of what might someday be. As 1993 came to a close, more information came to light. Sega abandoned the numbering scheme, adopting the subtitle Sennenki no Owari ni, in English, at the end of the millennium. The decision was made not to alienate newcomers who might feel put off by a game numbered 4 without having played the other three. It all led to the big day, where the massive 24 megabit cartridge 
and finale to the Algol Star System saga would go on sale to be enjoyed by an eager public. If you have not played Fantasy Star 4 and don't wish to have the game spoiled, now would be a good time to pause the video. You should play through the game and then come back when you're finished. On Motavia, in the year AW2284, bounty hunter Chaz Ashley has just been promoted from an apprentice to full partner by his mentor, Alice Brangwen. The two are requested to investigate an increase of dangerous biomonsters in Piata, the town of learning. There, the pair meet Han Malay, a biology student at Piata Academy, who joins the team for a fee. During the mission, Han divulges his encounters with a mysterious figure named Zio, who appears to know the lost art of black magic. Further investigation of Zio's actions led to Alice crossing paths with an old friend, Rune Walsh. The group in turn befriends a native Motavian, Grizz, who is on a mission of his own against Zio to avenge his friends and family. The quest takes a shocking turn when the source of the bio-monster outbreak comes from the ruins of an ancient civilization with advanced technology. Among the futuristic discoveries is Rika, a Newman. She looks and acts human, but also resembles an animal in certain ways. Rika tells Chaz and Alice that the bio-monsters can be stopped if the ancient control systems are shut down. Along the way, Alice and the rest find the town of Nalia partially destroyed by something that fell from the sky. The object was part of a ship meant to escape Palma for Motavia 1,000 years ago, but got trapped in orbit and was forgotten over time. More of the lost history of Algol is learned here. At the central system, Nervous, Demi, an android, has been operating things here for centuries. Before the system can be shut down, Zio appears once more, revealing more about his mission to serve his god, the Dark Force. During the confrontation, Zio moves to kill Chaz with a wave of dark energy, only for Alice to jump in and protect him. Chaz and the rest escape. While searching for the right equipment to combat Zio's black magic, Alice succumbs to her injuries. Chaz is now left all alone in this world to carve out his own destiny. Chaz defeats Zio, avenging his partner. With the evil magician gone, the team moves to shut down the bio-monster infestation. Except that Demi informs everyone that the commands are coming from artificial satellites orbiting Motavia. Demi reveals a functioning spaceship that can take everyone there. It would be the first spaceflight in Algol for quite some time. On the satellite Zilan, Chaz meets Ren, another android who has been working here the entire time. Ren has lost access to the systems which is now being run by the satellite Kuran, something that was never intended. Ren tags along to make things right. When the spaceship malfunctions, everyone winds up stranded on Dezorus. On the third planet, Chaz and the others meet Raja, a Dezorian high priest, as well as Kira Tierney, one of the many espers who live in a secluded mansion to protect the spirit of Lutz, one of the four original heroes that fought the Dark Force 2,000 years ago. While on Dezorus, more about the past is revealed through discovery, storytelling, and confrontations with Lashik, now resurrected by the Dark Force. It is also revealed that there is an even greater evil behind the last 2,000 years, the profound darkness, as well as a fourth planet, Rykros, the orbit of which coincides with each return of the Dark Force. Everyone eventually returns to Motavia to discover the legendary weapons that can defeat the Dark Force and the Profound Darkness, a final battle that must be won to ensure a peaceful and prosperous future for what remains of the Algol star system. As for the gameplay of Fantasy Star 4, much of it has been improved over the last three games. The menus appear over top any map, whether in a town, cave, or the overworld. Each character's level, hit points, technique points, and meseta totals are always shown. 
player has a choice of using an item or casting a technique. Robots can't use techniques, but can use skills, which are essentially the same. You can also equip items or check each character's stats in more detail individually. These include how much experience is needed to level up. When equipping, the player is informed on how much improvement the new weapon or armor will bring. The talk function is something rather novel. When selected, some of the most recent dialogue is repeated, providing a hint to the player as to where to go next. Not only does this help novices, but for anyone who has ever gotten into a role-playing game for a while, then had to put it down, only to come back much later and forgot what to do next, it is a lifesaver. Lastly, macro attacks can be configured in the main menu. Macros are a preset range of moves that can be used in battle. These save time from having to enter different commands over and over again. There is no automatic attack like there was in Phantasy Star 2 and 3. Instead, a macro where everyone attacks can be performed. Macros can also be used to create combo attacks, where multiple characters perform moves at the same time, resulting in a stronger attack than each one could do separately. The battles are fast moving, much faster than Phantasy Star 2, almost as fast as 3, but with a much better graphical presentation. The backgrounds are different for each area, and the character attacks are well drawn and animated fluidly. Movement on screen is the fastest of any Phantasy Star game. The towns, caves, and other areas are also much larger, with much to explore. So while you may move fast, things still take the same amount of time to reach. Along the way, there are optional side quests that Chaz can take for some extra money. In every town, there are interesting people to meet. Some have heartfelt stories to tell, while others are just overly eccentric. Many inanimate objects also spark a conversation. The soundtrack has nearly 50 compositions that craft the perfect atmosphere for the quest. From the playful Tonoe de Pon in Grizz's hometown, to the tense Machine Center and the dramatic At Her Last Breath, the music is just as important as any other aspect of the game. Once Millennium hit the streets of Japan, the game became a hot seller. Every major publication gave ample coverage, offering strategies and walkthroughs in multiple issues. Mega Drive Fan Magazine gave the new Fantasy Star a score of 24.5 out of 30. Beep Mega Drive gave a score of 8 out of 10, as well as letting Chaz and company share the cover with Sonic the Hedgehog. To promote Millennium, Sega held a contest where a special Mega Drive version of Phantasy Star 1 was given away to 1,000 lucky individuals. The contest drew such a large response, Sega put Phantasy Star 1 on sale properly in April 1994. Sega released a strategy guidebook for Millennium in January 1994. At 230 pages, the book is the ultimate companion, covering every town, dungeon, cave, enemy, item, boss, and plot twist. Accompanying the charts and maps are dozens of illustrations, all in full color. At the end of 1993, Sega was at about a 20% market share in Japan, behind the Super Famicom and PC Engine, though still at a respectable number. Millennium kept the Mega Drive going into 1994, where the game stood for sale side by side with heavy hitters like Final Fantasy VI, Mother 2, East 4, and dozens more. It's not a stretch to say that the golden era of 16-bit RPGs, where the genre finally moved beyond simple text menus, began to add cinematics, and reaching the maximum limits of the video game cartridge format all began with Phantasy Star, the end of the millennium, on December 17th, 1993. With Phantasy Star, the end of the millennium now available, Japanese reviews and import copies began to enter the Western world, at the start of 1994, it wasn't even known if this new Fantasy Star game would leave Japan in the first place. It wasn't always the case, but sometimes Japanese games that were previewed in the West would wind up going unreleased, then disappearing from the headlines without explanation, to great disappointment from those reading at home. No announcement one way or the other came until June, when Sega held a public event known as Sega Gamers Day, near the American home offices in California, a few days before the summer Consumer Electronics Show. 
The highlight of the event was the first announcement of the 32X add-on. Many other new games were announced, including Phantasy Star 4. The box art and English on-screen text were made publicly known. No release date was given, but as the year continued, more public demonstrations and announcements were made, including many localization changes. In Japanese, Alice was called Lila, Chaz was Rudy, Rika was Fall. The game would feature other linguistic changes, including the ever-troublesome handling of the names of the planets. The L and R in Palma and Dezorus were now switched to Parma and Dezolus. The end of the millennium would remain in the subtitle, but the American version would officially be known as Fantasy Star 4. With a strong lineup for Christmas 1994, which included Sonic and Knuckles, as well as many new 32X games, Sega decided to hold off on Fantasy Star 4 until after the new year. The game finally went on sale in February 1995. Due to the large memory size of the game and the translation work involved, Fantasy Star 4 carried a price tag of 99 US dollars, equal to the price that it sold for in Japan. Alongside Virtua Racing, Fantasy Star 4 was the most expensive home video game of all time. The end of the millennium was championed by the American gaming media upon release. In January 1995, Die Hard Game Fan gave Fantasy Star 4 that month's cover, and for several issues, the game was given a near step-by-step -step walkthrough, detailing the key elements of the early stages, explaining characters' origins, the effectiveness of items, and even poking a little fun at the less-than-perfect translation. In the April 1995 issue, the Viewpoint crew gave three scores over 90%. The game was still criticized for its translation, high price tag, and abandonment of the traditional Genesis hard plastic case. Despite this, GameFan called Phantasy Star 4 undeniably one of the greatest RPGs ever, truly brilliant, and a must-own game. Electronic Gaming Monthly also gave a full review of Millennium in April 1995, with a review crew score of 31 out of 40. The length of the game was praised, as were the characters and range of abilities that kept things interesting, while a general dislike of RPGs by some kept the overall score down. Phantasy Star 4 also had its own English guidebook. While the one Sega included for free with PS2 is certainly the most remembered, books for 3 and 4 were published. Created by two writers from Sega Visions magazine, the guide offered a comprehensive walkthrough for the entire game, complete with maps and strategies for different enemies. Though printed in black and white, at 170 pages, it is pretty thorough and worth the $12.95 price tag. As American fans were enjoying Millennium in February 1995, the game was left unreleased elsewhere. Sega initially had no plans to release PS4 worldwide, only to relent later on, releasing the game in the UK, Europe, and Australia in December 1995. Along the way, a version was released in South Korea, while in Brazil, the game was declined for a release by Tectoy. Reviews in the UK and Europe were similar to the US, with scores in the 80s and 90s in every publication. As Phantasy Star 4 was released after the 32-bit Sega Saturn in those regions, reviews often remarked that games like this prove there is still a lot of life left in 16-bit, and maybe it's best to keep the Mega Drive around for a while longer. Things don't last forever. In the spring of 1996, Sega restructured its product lines. The Sega CD and 32X were discontinued. Genesis and Mega Drive releases were reduced in number, and only the best-selling games remained in print. The Saturn was pushed to the front, with almost all new game development going there. Phantasy Star 4 was one of the many games pulled from production. Remaining copies were marked for clearance, often selling for as low as $25. By the end of 1996, Phantasy Star 4 was gone for good. It may have been a sad moment to know that our favorite series was officially over, and the entire 16-bit era closing down right alongside it. But at the same time, it was great to have that one final voyage, especially to those who picked up Phantasy Star 1 or 2, when Sega was seen as nothing special in the eyes of most gamers, not that many years before. 
To see the series live on to the final days of 16-bit is something to celebrate. Sure, Final Fantasy and many other series continue on, but at least we Fantasy Star fans can say this. We had all of our games released in English, on schedule, with the series never going off the rails and having a proper conclusion. It's something very few others can claim. That's something to feel good about, and wouldn't have any other way. Arcade graphics. The 30th anniversary Genesis does. 16-bit action. The 30th anniversary Genesis does. 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 Genesis does. Get Golden Axe, Shinobi 3, Fantasy Star 4, Streets of Rage 2, Shining Force, and many more. Only with the Genesis Mini. There are a lot of fun secrets hiding in Phantasy Star 4, as well as some strange and unusual discoveries. All of the quirks in the game are a huge part of what has made Phantasy Star 4 so endearing to fans for over 30 years. There are many connections to Sega's past hiding on Motavia and Azorus. Some are very obvious, and others less so. Lashik, the Air Castle, Aero Prism, Eclipse Torch, Alshine, Shortcakes, and other key items from the past show up again in Phantasy Star 4. It's clear that some of these are the same items that were used millennia ago, while others might be coincidental. They are all a great reward for fans who played through the older games in the series, and will create some funny what the moments for anyone who played PS4 first and the older games later. Alice Brangwen shares the name of the original hero, Alice Landale, though in Japanese she's known as Alisa. The spellings of the two names are different, and maybe that also accounts for the shift in spelling for the names of the three planets in Algol, if you'd like to imagine that everyone spoke the same language that has evolved over time. In the town of Termi, there is a statue of Alisa and Meow. Also for sale in that town is the Perori Mate, which has a special use later down the line. The name comes from the original Japanese name for the Die Mate, which in the English Fantasy Star 1 was a burger. The name is a pun on bland tasting crackers sold in Japan called Calorie Mate. In Piata, the town of learning, there is a statue of Dr. Luvino, the man who built Alisa's spaceship. Chaz is unaware of his deeds and only refers to the doctor as a person from 2000 years ago. Then there are other references to Sega in general. In the town of Krupp, Saya's school has three books, Golden Axe Volume 3, A Day with Echo, and Run Hedgehog Run. In the town of Nalia, Chaz finds a Game Gear in someone's house. At the Hunter's Guild in Aedo, the dance show plays the theme song from Fantasy Zone. The track is titled Pow Pow, a backward spelling of the hero of Fantasy Zone's name, Opa Opa. In Phantasy Star 2, the staff tried to connect the lineage of the heroes of the first and second games. Rolf was a descendant of Elisa Landale. The last one, in fact. Tyler was a descendant of Tyron, aka Odin. While Lutz was frozen alive, then revived. Meow's great-great-great-great-grandcats are also seen. In Phantasy Star 4, the same idea was applied to the four main heroes of the game, connecting each one to another game in the series. With so many characters, who exactly are the main four? The opening of the game tells you. Rune, Ren, Rika, and Chaz. Rune is meant to be a descendant of Lutz, aka Noah in the original Fantasy Star. He's actually the fifth generation of the legendary Esper, as explained in the story. Rika is a descendant of Ney in Fantasy Star 2, being created in the same way and looking very similar. They are sisters after all. Ren is but one of many robots with the same design seen in Phantasy Star 3. In the timeline of the series, the events of 3 still won't happen for 1,000 years, but each escape ship was built with Ren robots to help the Palmanians on their journey. Perhaps before the Great Collapse, there was one in every home on Palma. Jazz is a direct descendant of Elisa Landale, something that is hinted at near the end of the game, but is never spelled out clearly. 
As Rolf was the final descendant 1,000 years ago, it means that he somehow returned to Motavia after the final battle and had a family. As for Meow, the musk cats are still around and have learned how to open a bottle after 2,000 years of trying. There are several parts of the game that are not necessary, but can provide a bit of fun for going through the effort of discovering them. The Hunter's Guild in Aedo offers eight side quests that bring in some extra money, while taking a break from the battle against the Dark Force. These unlock after reaching certain parts of the game, and lock up again if you wait too long. So please visit the Hunter's Guild often. Here are all eight and how to complete them. Mission 1, The Ranch Owner. In Mile, a farmer has an infestation of sandworms. All you have to do is kill it, but you have to be leveled up enough first. Defeat the worm for 5,000 meseta. Mission 2, Tinkerbell's Dog. In Aedo, a family has lost their beloved dog, Rocky. From people who know the fat little mutt, you'll learn he likes sweets. Buy a shortcake in Aedo and look for the dog in either Termi, Krupp, or Monsen. Give Rocky the cake and send him home for 2,000 meseta. Mission 3, The Missing Student. A young lady from Piata, the town of learning, has quit school to join Zio's cult. The student is in Kaderi, near Zio's temple. She won't go with you until you give her a perori mate, which you can buy in Termi. Once she eats one, collect 3,000 meseta. Mission 4, Fisher of Fear. Recent earthquakes have opened up the ground in Monsen. A young boy went exploring in one and got lost. Talk to a lady in the town about it and enter the crack. Defeat the fact ooze and bring the kid home for 5,000 meseta. Mission 5, The Stain in Life. A family on Uso Island has had two daughters run away by building a raft and heading to Aedo. The girls are found in jail and the only way to get them out and complete the mission is to bribe the police. Pay 50,000 meseta to free the girls. Then collect your reward of 50,000 meseta. Mission 6, The Dying Boy. A child in Termi thinks he's going to die. He's faking it, but to make him feel better, buy an Alice sword in the town and show off some moves. After the boy is cured, collect 10,000 meseta. Mission 7, Man with a Twist. In Torinko, the fields are plagued with mutated birds who eat up everything in sight. Someone in town knows where the nest is. Go to a nearby cave where he directs you to battle the King Rappi, leader of the birds. The mission earns you 20,000 meseta. As an aside, Rappies are a common enemy in Phantasy Star 3, so they must have somehow gotten on the ship. Mission 8, Silver Soldier. Robots are causing trouble in Zima. In town, you'll be directed to move northeast to Valhalla Fort. Find the computer and turn it off to collect 80,000 meseta. Beyond that, there are several caves and dungeons that are not required to complete the game, but provide extra items, weapons, or techniques that could be useful. So don't pass up the Dezorus Climate Troll, Anger Tower, Weapons Plant, or Crashed Ship, and keep your eye out for other places to explore. Another optional feature in Phantasy Star 4 are the combo attacks. In the manual, these are explained briefly, with hints on how to perform the first few. The manual states there are 15 in all, and it's up to you to discover them. So, what are the combo attacks? Number 1. Firestorm can be performed with Foy and Zan, or Foy and Hune, or Philele and Zan. Number 2. Blizzard is a combination of Watt and Zan, or Watt and Hune. Higher levels of Zan are also okay. Number 3. Silent Wave is a mix of Phonomezer and Air Slash. Number 4. Tri Blaster is done with Watt, Foy, and Tsu. Number 5. Grand Cross is a combination of Cross Cut and Ephes. Number 6. Shooting Star requires Burst Rock and Nafoy. Number 7. Paladin Blow is a mix of Ray Blade and Astral. Number 8. Lethal Image is made by performing Death and Illusion. Number 9. Black Hole is a combination of Negatus and Nagra. Number 10. 
Circuit breaker only works on machines. Use high jammer and tandle. Number 11, Holocaust does not work on machines and is done with Savol and DM. Number 12, Conduct Thunder is performed by using Watt and Tandle. Number 13, Purify Light is a mix of Holy Word and Ephes. Number 14, Destruction, the most powerful combo attack, must be done in this order. Deban, Mejid, Legion, and Possibolt. Number 15, there is no number 15. Either Sega made a typo in the manual, or a 15th combo attack never made the final version of the game. In the US, Phantasy Star 4 was rated KA for kids to adults. This rating existed from the start of the ESRB and was replaced with E for Everyone in 1998. Later re-releases were rated E. Despite that, some scenes should have bumped things up to T. When Grizz confronts Zio for the first time, he says, Damn you, Zio! An actual swear word! In Kaderi, a Lady of the Night offers her services to Chaz. We know what those services are, but Chaz doesn't. Maybe that unclarity allowed this joke to slip by. There are also a few dirty old men here and there, if you look hard enough. Then there are all the demons, devil worship, scary images, at least for kids, and violence throughout the game. You have to wonder who rated Phantasy Star 4, and why those people thought this stuff was okay for kids. Or, if someone at the ESRB played for about 10 minutes and said, yeah, I've seen enough. One line of dialogue in particular has always raised eyebrows. The Eight Stroke Warrior. Alice seems embarrassed by this, and even conks the guy on the head to make him quiet. The explanation for how Alice got this title is pretty cool. In the Japanese writing system, pictographic characters, known as kanji, are made up of various strokes. There are eight different types of strokes that can be used. The character for eternity uses each of these eight strokes once. As such, the number eight is seen as lucky in Japanese culture, similar to seven in the West. When Alice is called the eight-stroke warrior, it refers to her being the most skilled sword fighter around, having mastered every move and using them all in every battle. Now what were you thinking? There are still a few oddities left to cover. Some character designs are based on real life people. Zio is based on Trent Reznor, right down to the hairstyle that he had while promoting and touring for the Broken EP in 1992 and 93, when Phantasy Star 4 was being developed. Ren looks a lot like Edward Scissorhands, and considering the two of them were built, it kind of makes sense. Except that Ren first appeared in Phantasy Star 3, which was released over six months before the film. Maybe he's actually based on Edward's inspiration, Robert Smith from The Cure. Seth, who was encountered in the second half of the quest, was designed to look like Yukio Sato, an artist who worked at Sega on Panic, Ristar, and Rent a Hero No. 1, just to name a few, before moving up the ladder to upper management. While having his likeness in the game, Yukio Sato is quite a private person and dislikes being photographed. As such, no photo of Mr. Sato exists. But then again, you don't need one. This is exactly what he looks like. There are also two items that have no apparent use in the game. One shop in Termi sells a pennant and a wood carving statue of a sandworm at the same store where other apparently useless items can be had. Those help complete the Hunter's Guild quests, but the pennant and carving can't be used or equipped, so what is it there for? Head back home and interact with the wall and table in Alice's house, and these items will be placed on display. A nice reminder of taking a trip to the world's most famous town that was once visited by Elisa Landale thousands of years ago. And this is not even the full list! There were all kinds of secrets hiding in the game just waiting to be found as well as different variations of dialogue that you might have missed. It all depends on who's in your party at the time, and even your lead character will alter the conversation. It's all great fun and certainly gives you a reason to fire up the Genesis or Mega Drive one more time to see what you've missed, giving you something fun to do long after you've saved Algol. 
Fantasy Star 4 The End of the Millennium lives on in soundtracks, reissues, a few cameos, and an expanded universe with lots to explore. Alongside The End of the Millennium, Sega released Fantasy Star Sound Collection 2, a companion album to the original, released prior to the final game. The album features 12 rearranged tracks from Millennium that range in tone from orchestral to rock to piano ballads. Ritor Music and Sega collaborated to release a MIDI pack for Fantasy Star 4. Stored on two floppy disks compatible with MS-DOS and Roland GS instruments, the package contained six MIDI arrangements from the game, as well as eight standard tracks. Ritor collaborated with other publishers to release MIDI packs for games such as Gradius and The Legend of Zelda. This package is one of the rarest gaming items in existence, with few copies surviving to the modern day. As for a standard full soundtrack, music from the series was released on a four-disc set in 2007 to commemorate the 20th anniversary of the series. The End of the Millennium was fortunate enough to be re-released by Sega over the years to ensure fans young and old alike can keep up to date with the game on modern hardware. The first of these came in 1998 with Fantasy Star Collection for the Sega Saturn. The compilation featured all four games as well as art galleries and TV commercials. The set was brought to the PlayStation 2 in 2008 as Fantasy Star Complete Collection which was then made a downloadable PlayStation 3 title in 2012. This is the best compilation and most recommended way to play Fantasy Star 4. There are language options and an easy mode where you can collect 2, 4, or 8 times the experience and meseta from each battle. The Sega Ages series on the Nintendo Switch does not feature Fantasy Star 4, but Rika appears in the opening titles of many games alongside Nei, Mew, Alex Kidd, and other characters. Rika also appears in Columns 2, The Voyage Through Time, as the Jewel Case character for stages 66 to 70 in Flash Columns. There were a few times where End of the Millennium didn't make the final cut. Fantasy Star Collection for the Game Boy Advance, released in 2002, features the first three games in the series, but not four. The game was simply too big to fit on the cartridge. Despite that, Alice is featured on the title screen, so you can't say they didn't try. In 2003, Sega debuted a new series of games for the PlayStation 2, lower-priced remakes of classic titles under the Sega Ages 2500 label. The first volume of these was Fantasy Star Generation 1, a complete remake of the original game from 1987. When the Sega Ages 2500 series was first announced, Sega declared its intentions on remaking Fantasy Star 2 and 4 as well. Generation 2 came to pass in 2005 as Volume 17. Generation 4 seemed like a sure thing, though updates of the game stalled as the Sega Ages 2500 series continued on. The Generation games were never released in English, though others from this series made it to the West as part of Sega Classics Collection. In 2007, Sega announced that Generation 4 was cancelled and Complete Collection would take its place as Volume 32. The news stung fans of the series. While not having an English localization was one thing, a complete shutdown of the game in Japan was another. Sega never gave an official explanation for the cancellation, and strangely enough, years later, absolutely no images of the game, nor an unfinished version, have ever been seen by anybody. It's only reasonable to surmise that work on the game never started. Considering the amount of text that was added to the first two games, to rewrite the script in the style of Generation 1 and 2 was most likely too costly and time-consuming. Whatever actually happened, nobody will ever know. While the original series basically ends here, there were two pieces of media that went beyond the boundaries of the game, adding to the backstory of the Algol star system. In 1988, Sega published a small fan newsletter, Spec, Sega Players Enjoy Club, for short. Each spec was filled with insider information and artwork from Sega game designers. Among these was a story illustrated by Yoshibon, third, which began in March 1990. In the story, a hunter named Rudy meets Nay Third, a human-animal hybrid with a mysterious past. The adventure takes place in the year AW1423, about 140 years after the Great Collapse. Third is clearly the launching point for many ideas that made it into the final version of Phantasy Star 4. 
Rudy is the Japanese name for Chaz. Rudy looks like a cross between Chaz and Demi. Rika is really the third Nay, if you think about it, and Nay third even has a picture of Professor Holt in her apartment. Unfortunately, the story ends on a cliffhanger. At the end of 1990, Speck took a long hiatus and returned with only one more official issue in 1992. By then, work on Millennium had properly begun. The final issue does feature a comic by Yoshibon, serving as an apology for never bringing the adventures of Nay third to a proper conclusion. In 1995, Sega published the Fantasy Star Image Compendium, a collection of artwork and interviews from across the entire series. On the final page, Yoshibon pens another comic, offering yet another apology. It was quite an interesting story, and while we can only wonder what the fate of Nay Third was, a similar idea came to fruition after Fantasy Star 4 was completed. In 1995, Sega and SoftBank produced a radio drama album titled Sealed Memories. The audio novel is set three years before the final battle with the Profound Darkness, back to a time when a 13-year-old Chaz met Nay. This Nay is not the real Nay from 1,000 years ago, but a clone of the original, known as NM-1153. Chaz and Nay meet an old man named Roy, who shows them where Nay was created, an old biolab regulated by a supercomputer, Gene. Chaz discovers the purpose of creating Nay-type life forms, so that humanity can be wiped out and replaced with Nays, which Gene considers a superior species. Nay first and a third Nay, NM2011, conspire to kill Nay for refusing to follow orders. Other characters include Rika, Rune, and Ren in post-game roles, as well as Rolf through Nay's memory. Here is a short sample. I こう、<笑> The album included a fan book containing illustrations of all characters and profiles of the voice actors. Details of the Fantasy Star series were also included. One more highlight to this album. The voice of Nei was none other than Kotono Mitsuishi, the voice of Sailor Moon. Following these releases, the end of the Millennium and Fantasy Star as a whole were considered finished. The members of Team PS4 moved on to other projects. Rieko Kodama's next major work was an anime-based RPG, Magic Knight Ray Earth, for the Sega Saturn in 1995. Sega worked with the animation team to deliver one of the first video games based on an anime TV show that actually looked very close to the source material. Toru Yoshida joined a new division within Sega, CS2, to create Sakura Taisen, also known as Sakura Wars, for the Saturn in 1996. This game led to several sequels, as well as its own anime series, that tied into the game. The two would reunite to work on Skies of Arcadia for the Dreamcast in 2000. Several other members of Team PS4 were part of at least one of these three games. This set of games is often compared to Phantasy Star 4, not just due to connections in personnel. The gameplay style, themes, and humor are all very similar. The Fantasy Star brand would be revived in 2000 with Fantasy Star Online, led by Sonic Team veteran Yuji Naka. The online series does not have much in common with the original set of games, but was a critical and commercial success, continuing into the 2010s, often inspiring newcomers to look up the original series and see where things all began. In the 30 plus years since the release of Fantasy Star 4, most of the team stayed with Sega for the rest of their careers. I would be remiss not to give a tribute to Rieko Kodama. Without her, the Fantasy Star series wouldn't have the charm it did, and her work at Sega overall deserves recognition. She passed away on May 9, 2022, at the age of 58. She will be missed and never forgotten. The Sega Genesis has blast processing. Super Nintendo doesn't. So what's blast processing do?
if you don't have blast processing? <laughs> We've made it to the end, not just of this video, but of the entire original mainline Fantasy Star series. I hope you have enjoyed watching it as much as I have making it. One thing I said many years ago in the original video is that hopefully a Fantasy Star 5 would come our way. While that might have been exciting at one time, I've come to think that a fifth game is no longer on my wish list and might even be a bad thing. Far too much time has gone by. Sure, in the 90s and 2000s, every compilation always made me wistful for those days of the original series. And I had to ask, why can't Sega just get it together and make PS5? Maybe in that question lies the answer. It has been a long time since Phantasy Star 4, 30 years and counting. Nearly all of the staff from the 80s and 90s are retired. Some are no longer with us. What would that fifth game even be like without anyone from the originals involved? Perhaps it's for the best that there is no Phantasy Star 5. It keeps the series locked into a definitive ending with its integrity maintained. More than that, I think four games is plenty enough. If you were a teenager in the 16-bit era, it was the perfect amount. Maybe the gap between three and four was a bit long, but all of the games coincided with the right age to play them. Imagine being an adult and having to catch up with Fantasy Star 11, made by God knows who, grinding for hundreds of hours just to keep up with a tradition from long ago. We may not always want to admit it, but sometimes we need things to end, and to end properly, just to grow out of them and move on to whatever the next thing is. We can, and should, look back at that time with appreciation. Four games in about six years that told a great story with a definitive conclusion that was truly wonderful. We should count our blessings when it comes to that. Fantasy Star never gave us the heartbreak that nearly every other RPG series had in the 90s. There were no cancellations or lost games. We had them all. And we still have them today. Much like how Motavia and Dezoris are still out there, spinning around Algol somewhere in the universe. Our beloved series is still with us. It may be over, but we can always take a trip back anytime we want and save the world all over again. <laughs>